Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, Parlor, and Instagram. And of course, be sure to visit www.mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Many moons ago, a nameless evil was imprisoned in a place far beyond reach. Hurry up! If he were ever to be released, it would spell certain doom for all existence. Is that fear I smell? Your planet will be torn to pieces, and I will Mimi, treat your fuck. screams as I rip. Is this yours? Oh. Be? Oh my god. The gem of Paraxidite. Whoever wields it is able to command me. Go over there. Uh, and wait for us to come back in the morning. You will suffer an eternity for this. Bye. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 331. Releasing in Australia on the 3rd of March on video on demand, DVD and Blu-ray, is Psycho Gorman, an out-of-this-world horror comedy in which a young girl unnerves a mysterious gem that controls an evil monster whose sole purpose is to to destroy the universe. A fantastically bloody, exceptionally bizarre, and thoroughly entertaining practical effects-driven sci-fi horror comedy, Psycho Gorman is unlike anything you have ever seen, and for that reason should be seen by everyone. And I'm glad to say that joining me now on the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is a writer and director of Psycho Gorman, Stephen Kostansky. Stephen, I thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me. So Psycho Gorman, it it really does blend kind of like this sci-fi horror monster movie with like a kid's adventure story. Um, How did you come up with the idea to kind of combine these two seemingly different worlds in the one film? Uh, Well, the legend goes that a few years ago, I just finished making Leprechaun Returns, uh, shooting that out in South Africa. I'd come back to Canada. I was taking a bit of a break, and uh, I treated myself to the Blu-ray of Rawhead Rex, mm-hmm. which I'd never seen. I was watching that film, and as I was watching it, I uh, started riffing on this idea of like an ancient evil being resurrected, but like like that core concept from Rawhead Rex, I really like. but I started thinking like, what would I do with this to spice it up? And that's when I settled on the idea of like, well, what if you mash that with like ET and you've got this like ancient evil that's like risen from the earth and is going to wreak havoc, but also has to hang out with a couple kids in suburbia. Uh, I mean, the movie's also inspired by just my experiences as a kid watching a lot of R-rated uh, sci-fi uh, horror and action movies, mm-hmm. uh, movies that I was maybe a little too young to be watching. And so the uh, traumas of those experiences watching stuff like Terminator 2 and Aliens and Robocop and Guyver 2, uh, this movie's kind of me dealing with those traumas uh, in a lot of ways. Um, because as a kid, you know, obviously you watch those kinds of movies and you're in love with all the sci-fi tropiness of it, but uh, are shocked by the horrible violence uh, that sometimes is on display. And so as a kid, your brain like kind of doesn't really know what to do with that. The like fun fantasy component being mashed against the hard violence component and the like harsh reality of some of the scenarios. And so I wanted to make a movie that really played with that idea of jumping back and forth between kind of like fun fantasy wish fulfillment and like horrible uh, kind of like brutal realities of these situations. So yeah, that's uh, where the movie came from. The title of the film and indeed the name of the, the movie's main character, Psycho Gorman, such an interesting name. Um, so in the States, the full title of your movie is PG Psycho Gorman. That PG aspect of it, is that kind of like a riff, kind of like on E.T.? You were talking about 1980s movies influences. Were you trying to get that kind of vibe with it as well in regards to the title? Yeah, well, when I came up with the concept, I definitely was riffing on E.T. And I was trying to think, like, well, what's like a fun abbreviation? Like, I knew I wanted a nonsense name, like Psycho Gorman. Uh, P 
purely because I wanted it to be a thing that people had to say out loud. Like it made me laugh. The idea of like a bunch of like, I don't know, execs or something at like a film market talking about a movie and they have to say the name psycho Gorman out loud. Mm. Uh, so that was part of my reason for coming up with such an absurd title, but then also, yeah, I wanted to riff on ET and I, as I was kind of like figuring out what the title would be, I realized like, Oh, there's never really been a movie called PG. Like nobody's ever gone into the rating system and taken one of those and used it. And it just seemed like, like crazy that no one had done it, but also such easy marketing to, to latch onto uh, kind of like an abbreviation for a rating uh, like something, such a recognizable logo and abbreviation. So yeah, part of my reason was also just to piggyback um, the kind of like omnipresence of the term PG. Uh, and it's definitely something that growing up, I being a video store kid definitely saw on a lot of movie boxes uh, growing up. So it I made love, sense. I love the creature creations in your film. You have all these kind of various monsters. And I know your background is in creature design and effects and you handled the prosthetic and f- creature effects works on this movie as well. I'm curious, how do you come up with your ideas? Do you like to sketch your ideas out? Do you sculpt first? How does the whole kind of creative process work for you? Uh, with PG, it was not your typical design process. I know usually like working on bigger films, usually the process is like you get concept art done and you go back and forth on that concept art until somebody like eventually you settle on a look and then people build it based off of that image or that ZBrush design or whatever. But uh, with PG, it was way more loose in terms of how we designed creatures. Mm -hmm. I definitely had inspirations for everything but I didn't do like full on designs for every creature. The only ones that had actual uh, designs uh, done by my uh, a comic book artist friend of mine, he did uh, PG and Pandora, are very like kind of basic sketches of the two. Um, but as far as every other creature, in a lot of cases, I would just start sculpting a thing. And I had an idea in my head of what I wanted it to be. And as I, you know, made the mask and the suits and, uh, kind of like all the gear and the components as, as they, as I started to put the pieces together, that's when I decided what the look of the creature was. Uh, so a lot of times the final result was not exactly what was in my head, but I liked that process, especially for this movie. I wanted to have as much variety as possible. And I thought, you know, if I do a traditional design process of getting like one concept artist to do everything, it's going to feel very samey. Uh, and so I wanted it to be a little more slapdash and a little more free form uh, and let the artists that are, are working on all this stuff kind of inject a bit of their personality into it too, mm. as well, uh, by not locking them into specific designs. So it, it was uh, a deliberate choice to be a little more loose uh, with what the looks of the creatures were. I now want to talk about the biggest monster of them all, and that's the character of Mimi, the 12-year-old girl in the film, played by Anita Josie Hanna, who's absolutely fantastic in the role. How did you come about casting that role of Mimi, and how did you end up finding Nita, who I think this is her feature film debut, is that correct? Yes, it is, and it's crazy that it is because she's so damn good in it. Absolutely, and, uh, yes. She, And it's not like it took a lot of work on my part as a director to, like, get her into that character like Nita already is a little bit of Mimi in a lot of ways and she'll fully admit that um so we really lucked out with our casting on this movie especially with the kids um it was a big concern going in that like how are we going to find uh actors that can live up to what's on the page especially with Mimi like she's such a bold character and it needed to be bold to justify being able to stand up to PG in the way that she does um but yeah nita was in one of our i think our first round of auditions and we just kept getting her to come back and keep reading for the character and she was like you know very passionate about getting the role and being a part of the film and uh i could just tell that she was such a like already a little professional she's like uh does theater and theater and dance and had so much experience already at such a young age that I knew she'd be perfect for the part because to me, like bringing some experience 
into a project like this is crucial. Uh, I didn't want a kid who wasn't prepared to be on set with like 50 people every day. Like you're kind of rolling the dice in some cases, but with Nita and with Owen and with Scout, uh, all three of them were just totally prepared uh, for, for what we threw at them. And it was, you know, a very hectic schedule being a low budget movie, but uh, Nita just brought so much professionalism to the role had the whole script memorized. She knew what was going on more than I did half the time. Mm. Uh, yeah. It was like, she really like, really like made the part her own and brought everything she had and just like did a fantastic job in my opinion. Like the movie, the movie works because she works so well in that role. There's an interesting component to this whole in the movie uh, is a game called crazy ball. It's kind of like dodgeball on steroids. There's all of these kind of crazy rules. And I think it suits it being kind of like a kid's game because it just seems like the the characters kind of make it up as they go along. It's kind of hard to keep up with everything that's going on there. Yeah. How real is Crazy Ball? Is this a game that you have actually played? Is this something that you developed for the film? I mean, I made it up for the movie. There were rules, like a very basic structure of rules that I came up with because uh, it made – it's. I didn't want to just make gibberish on the page, like, and then have the actors be confused by it. I wanted it to at least make some, the most like base level of sense. Yeah. Uh, just it help inform the performances. Like I wanted the kids to like, look like they knew what they were doing uh, and were confident in what they're playing. Cause the whole joke to me is that they understand it and nobody else does. Uh, so there are rules for it. Actually, a few days ago, I finally wrote them out. Uh, because everyone's been asking like what are the rules to this game so someday those might uh materialize for people to see and attempt to play i'm very confident it won't be fun uh (laughs) it is a the rules are total gibberish um but yeah they do exist and it's i mean an homage to uh calvin and Hobbes, my favorite comic strip growing up uh in that calvin plays a game called calvin ball that's uh, like kind of a nonsense dodgeball game. And so I wanted to do a little reference to that uh, because it's so influential on me uh, growing up. And I do think this movie has a little bit of that spirit of Calvin and Hobbes to it uh, in like a twisted, in a, in a more twisted way. Well, for everyone listening out there, Psycho Gorman releasing March 3rd on VOD, DVD and Blu-ray. I recommend everyone check out the Blu-ray. It's got really cool kind of extra features in there and documentaries. And uh, Stephen, look, I just want to congratulate you for the film. It's um, it's a blast. Um, it really seems like this is a, a film that you had a blast making. And I know you've described it as a once in a lifetime opportunity to create a film without studio interference and to just let out that creative outlet. I'm sure you're very pleased with the response you've gotten so far. And I'm sure you can't wait for people in Australia to watch the film as well oh yeah i'm very excited i hope uh yeah everybody picks up that blu-ray because there's tons of good bonus features on it and uh yeah let's keep physical media alive too because i love buying dvds and blu-rays and uh this is the kind of movie that uh, if i didn't make it i would be buying it immediately because uh yeah I, i just wanted to make a movie that fit on the video store shelf uh when I was a kid, like something that I would go and uh, pick out uh, on like family movie night, uh, much to the distress of my parents. So yeah, my whole goal was to make something that fit into that uh, video store VHS era. And uh, yeah, hopefully the response is good in Australian people, uh, people embrace it. So for everyone listening, March 3rd, Psycho Gorman, buy the Blu-ray, support physical media, support indie horror artist, and Stephen Kostansky, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. It was great talking to you.